everyone. So thank you all for being with us this evening. My name is Jessica Colligan, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Alumni Relations Office. With me are Father Jerry Blazczyk, who is our alumni chaplain and special assistant to the president, and Father Keith Maskowitz, who is a member of Fairfield's class of 2004. And he returned to campus this past July as our director of campus ministry and a university chaplain. Now, before we kick things off, just a couple of reminders. First, I ask that you please keep your microphones muted just to minimize any distractions. And second, I encourage you to use speaker view rather than gallery view in Zoom, just to keep the focus of your screen on Father Jerry and Father Maskowitz. And finally, we encourage you to use the chat feature in Zoom if you have any questions, and we'll do our best to get to all of them in the time allotted. And now I will turn things over to Father Jerry to get us started. Thanks very much, Jess. And I see many faces, many familiar faces, uh, uh, our friends and members of our larger community and of our alumni community. Thank you all for uh, joining us for this opportunity to get to know a little bit better uh, our own Keith Makowitz. Uh, as you know, this series began back in 2020 as part of the alumni offices series on spirituality. One of the aspects that we thought would be a great way to uh, have an entree into Ignatian spirituality would be through opportunities to hear from Jesuits about their own personal journeys. Ignatian spirituality is not a theory, it's a practice, it's a way of life, it's a way of the heart, it's a way of involvement with other people. And so um, no better way in my mind uh, to come to know better what is at the essence of Ignatian spirituality than to get acquainted with somebody who's been living it. And uh, our interviewee this evening has been living it for a good number of years, but he first encountered Ignatian spirituality as it was being lived, as it was being lived, some 20 years ago, uh, when a young boy from Long Island came up in the year 2000 to join the freshman class at Fairfield University. Keith, how in the world did you find Fairfield or how did Fairfield find you? And what was it like when you, uh, when you stepped foot on our campus for the first time? Well, thanks, Jerry. Good to be with you. Good to be with all of you. I'm looking at the, the list here. There's a few of my classmates here uh, and a few Jesuits I've lived with uh, over the years. Uh, and good to be with all of you. Uh, one thing, I didn't arrive in the summer of 2000. Actually, I was a transfer student. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I got that wrong. No, that's all right. So I actually, I grew up on Long Island uh, uh -huh. and I went to public school and I was a theater major. I thought I wanted to go into theater. So I I was a member of the freshman class at Emerson College up in Boston. And uh, I was there for one semester when I realized that my life was not going to be all cast parties and you know, you know, curtain calls essentially and jazz hands. So I, uh, I, I remember this vividly. My father drove me back from Christmas break all the way back up to Boston. I had a great address, 100 Beacon Street. It was a dorm at the time. And he dropped me off. I called my mother as my dad was on the way home. And I said, have dad call me when he gets home. I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> Exquisite timing, Keith. <laughs> I bet your father I, I, loved that. I, I don't know. I couldn't like screw up the courage in the car to tell him that I hmm. wanted to transfer. So uh, I did one year at Emerson, but I knew I was I was going after one semester. So mm -hmm. um, I remember thinking I remember using Google for one of the first times and I typed in Catholic college and closer to home, basically. Huh. And, uh, Fairfield came up. I didn't even know what a Jesuit was. I had never heard of the Jesuits. Wow. Um, wow. I moved out of the dorm at Emerson on May 1st, 2000 came straight to Fairfield and I took a tour uh, with all of my stuff in the car. Uh, I was just recounting with my staff today because we had a holiday party in Bellarmine. Mm. The admissions was up there at Bellarmine. So the tour started in that kind of great room. Uh, and it made, it made a large impression on me, certainly. Um, and we took a, a walk around and my father turned to me. My father doesn't say a lot, but he's, he said to me, I can see you here. Wow, wow. Yeah, and that, that meant something to me, certainly. Um, it's astounding so, sometimes. We were talking about this at home a few nights ago. I was recounting how occasionally my mother would say something that would be like a, a stunningly clear understanding of who her son was. Uh, and it's amazing when our parents reflect that back to us. Huh? Your father could see it. 
Yes, and I think it meant more because my father's German, like born in Germany, German. So he doesn't say too much to begin with. You know, he's very, uh, he's rather stoic. So when he does say things, I take, I listen. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so was I it arrived, true, Keith? Was it, yeah. did, did you very quickly discover that your father's intuition was correct? That there was a, a, a deep fit here somehow? Yeah, it wasn't right away. I mean, I arrived... What, Labor Day weekend has always been moving weekend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is that? September 4th or so. I was here about a week and I still wasn't, I wasn't sure, frankly. You know, I went to class and my roommate was also a transfer student from Loyola Marymount out in LA. And, uh, but he, his girlfriend was on the volleyball team. So he kind of had his people and I, I didn't have my people right, right from the beginning, but I arrived literally like a week before 9-11. And wow, wow. I have vivid memories of that day being on campus so close to the city. But what I remember most was I remember going to lunch in the dining room and there were, you know, these little paper tents showed up on the table and it said, there'll be a mass outside of Egan Chapel this, uh, this afternoon. Oh. You know, all are welcome. And we sat on the hill just down the road from Bellarmine and, um, it seemed like everybody was there and the skies were quiet. The Jesuit community was there, probably 30 men at the time. And that was the moment I knew I belonged. I was like, if this is the type of community that this is what they do in a moment of crisis and in a moment of import, this is where I want to be. Uh, wow. It was like wow. very clear to me right in that moment. Wow, Keith. Have you re obviously, you've reflected on that since. What was your what was your youthful instinct? What did you pick up about this community such that it would gather at that moment with Eucharist? You know, I, in the years since, I've done a lot of work. You know, I did like a license in theology and in ritual studies, essentially, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it's this innate sense that like humans are ritual animals, you know, ritual beings. We need ritual. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's why there's teddy bears on the side of the road where someone has gotten into a cataclysmic car accident, you know, and, and why, you know, families go to the lake for certain holidays, right? There's like, there, there are rituals that we need uh, just to, to be human. And I think like that was the moment for me. I, I look back at it now and said like, that was where my love for ritual was really nourished. And I wow, thought wow. this is a place for me uh, that I, that I want to be. Well, this is maybe jumping far, far ahead then. So uh, <laughs> what do you do with that now? You know, now, now you are not the recipient, but you are, you know, you're not just the beneficiary of some community and some community leaders who understood the importance of ritual. But now that you're back, and I'm, I'm going to, we will go back to your student days too, but this is too rich a possibility here that I can't resist mining. Now that you're back on campus, you saw a need for ritual uh, immediately uh, uh, after 9-11. What's your sense with this generation of students and the times in which we live? Uh, what about the role of ritual now? What, what is ritual responding to? And what must ritual somehow, um, what, what, what must it do for people who live in the circumstances, especially of our students? COVID, racial tension, whatever. How do you see it in the role of ritual and what you do in campus ministry? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's a human need for ritual. So I wouldn't say it's actually moved too much uh, in terms of what the need is. I would say we are less familiar with like the old rituals that we have come to depend on. You know, I, I've i been to some weddings now, people who, you know, they want their friends to marry them. Those weddings are usually very short uh, because, you know, people don't, don't always know how to build ritual. Uh, right. Right. They don't want to lean into old rituals because they think they might be stodgy mm -hmm. or old or too traditional or whatever. Uh, but we, we crave ritual. You know, I just did a funeral the other day and, you know, it was very clear the deceased didn't, he, he left wishes. He did not want, he didn't want prayers, you know, like he didn't want them. But mm -hmm. the family needed them, you know, and, the, and it, especially in a death, those prayers are not, they're not for the deceased, they're for, the, they're for everybody else. Uh, you know, and so like we, we, we need something to lean into, something to, mm -hmm. to hold on to. And I think for young people today, you know, we've lost so much in the last few years. So like we, we need these types of things, you know, and, and they need to be rich. Uh, I think I wrote a, my thesis was on basically like, you know, impoverished and bifurcated rituals that we've made them 
in some ways we've made them less than they should be. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. shame on us because we people are starving to death, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if we just gave people kind of what the, the especially the church's rituals are, we, we could nourish people pretty well. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's obviously a big part of what you see in your role now as director of campus ministry, making available the extraordinary richness of our, of our ritual uh, history and tradition, I guess, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I think some people say like, well, kids don't want to go to mass, but we were just talking today in, in, in the community, you know, there's this freshman who he told me the other day, we we're about to change the mass schedule on campus that Jim Fitz today told me the 1210 Mass has been a 1210 daily Mass since he was a student in the 60s uh, when it was in Loyola Chapel. Mm. And the class schedule has certainly changed since then, but the Mass schedule has not changed to kind of go with it. So we're going to change it from 1210 to 1230 because we got students who are walking in at 1220 because they get out of class at 1215. Anyway, I said to this kid the other day, student, uh, we're going to change the Mass schedule. I see you walking in late. Uh, and he said, oh, I don't care. And I thought, oh, I thought you'd care. And he said, no, I, I changed my mind. I, I'm not taking any classes between 11 and 2, so I can make sure that I get to daily mass. Wow. wow. You know, so it's, wow. there's a false narrative that says, like, young people are not interested in these things. Like, young people are craving these things. Uh, wow. It, wow. I think sometimes it's a, a product of an older generation that we don't, we don't want to give it to them for some reason. Keith, this is a good time maybe for a commercial because you've already uh, let us know that you know, there's going to be some changes, not only in the midday calendar, but uh, you're thinking of doing something in the evenings, right, it, uh, for our students. And does this correspond, does this respond to what you've been discussing, what, the sense you feel that, that, uh, that our students have an interest in, and a renewed capacity uh, for, for ritual that the church has to offer? Yes, and it's also tied into vocation work, frankly. You know, I, I I think Jesuits get vocations at institutions that have robust sacramental life uh, because they allow young men to see priests being priests. So we're going to start offering Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, something between eight and nine each night. Tuesdays and Thursdays, confession from eight to eight thirty and mass at eight thirty. And then on Wednesdays, we'll do an hour of adoration with confessions during. Uh, uh, just to, again to give students a place to go. Uh, a place to plug in and to to drive them, you know, to to a to the the real spiritual home of the campus, to the chapel. Mm, mm, mm. It's very exciting, Keith, and very very hopeful. So let's jump back twenty years. So it, it was the experience uh, of being together in a ritual setting, specifically um, responding to the tragedy of nine eleven that you felt that you had a connection, that this was a place where you were uh, in communion with other people. Uh, what, what else about the university or your experience um, touched your heart and made you say, this is not only that this is a home for me, but uh, gave you values and, and orientations that you would clearly take uh, and, and make your own in the years afterwards. Yeah, and I, that really can be localized, I would say, in two sp very specific people, one of whom is on the call tonight. Uh, maybe a week after 9-11, I was at the evening mass. They have, it was late evening. I can't remember what time. But, um, you know, one of the, this woman came over and she said, do you have any questions about campus ministry? And it was Carolyn Rizikas. And oh, I should have guessed. Yeah, and I said, <clears throat> uh, yeah, how do you become one of those Eucharistic ministers? And I had never thought that I was interested in that, but I had been an altar server all growing up when I was a kid, and it was seemed to be like the next obvious thing, which that gets into a much larger story about who I understand God to be. God is, a, I think about this all the time, God is the next obvious thing. Um, but I said to her, how do you become a Eucharistic minister? And she said, what year are you? And I said, I'm a sophomore. And she said, good, I have space for you. Come see me in my office tomorrow. And that semester, I started training, and I was commissioned as a Eucharistic minister, and I served in that ministry for the next three years. Uh, and I served as a, a leader of that ministry when I was a senior. So um, that became, the, the chapel was like a home for me. You know, it was just, it was the place I spent a lot of time, a place where I felt I learned a lot about my faith. Um, it, it was I, I, I want to say it was a safe space, but it was, it was a nurturing space, you know, mm -hmm. very much so for me. Um, the other person was uh, Terry Devino, a Jesuit who came when I was a senior. I was like a junior. I think I helped interview him when I was a junior. Uh, and he came senior year. 
he was great. He said to me, you know, when I was a senior, he said, you should think about like being a Jesuit. And I was, I was dating somebody at the time. And I, and I thought, uh, no, I think I'm all right. He goes, we're having a day of prayer down at the swamp house, the old Jesuit house. And, uh, I said, all right, maybe I'll go to a day of prayer. That's, that seems okay. So I told my girlfriend at the time, and she said, you're not going to that. And I, so, <laughs> so I, I did not go to that, but. Oh, oh that, so you didn't go. <laughs> I did not. But that invitation, and I think BC has done research on this, that like, unless a man is asked by multiple people multiple times, you know, would you, would you consider being a priest or a Jesuit? Uh, you know, but I, that invitation stuck, you know, so, uh, mm-hmm. you know, have you ever thought about this? You should think about this. I eventually, I worked for Terry at the University of Scranton. He was the director of campus ministry and I was working in campus ministry before I entered the Jesuits. Uh, and when I got there, he stopped saying, uh, you should think about this. And he started saying, what are you waiting for? And he, he said it to give me great, he, he did give me great freedom, but he was just like, this is the next obvious thing, you know? And uh, so I entered, you know, I worked for him for two years and then I entered the Jesuits in 2008. Okay, we'll get back to your vocation story, but you mentioned a name uh, that comes up almost every time we have a, a Jesuit talk about his uh, journey here, uh, and that name is Carolyn Rizikas. Uh, there's something about the way Carolyn related to students uh, that in my brief encounter with her and my observation and my conversations with alumni and alumnae, Carolyn had a, a genius in touching young lives. What, uh, and I'm, ho- I'm glad you're, I hope you're listening carefully, Carolyn. Uh, but what, what was it? What was, what's Carolyn's gift? Carolyn is one of the best listeners that I know. Uh, so you could just go in there and talk. And she asked very probing questions, always appropriate, of course, but she, she was interested you know, so she expressed mm. interest, you know, and Katie Burns is also on the call. Katie sees a lot of students as well. She's a colleague of mine in campus ministry. Katie sees a lot of students and it's because she asks a lot of good questions, you know, and students are drawn to that. And, uh, and it's questions, they're not questions that are vacuous. They're questions about people's real life and uh, people's real faith, you know, and mm-hmm. to be able to go someplace to, at, to ask and answer those questions or just to sit in the complexity is also like that. I was totally interested in that. Um, that I found that a good model for my own ministry. You know, it, it going uh, leaving Fairfield because I basically started working in campus ministry upon graduation. Yeah. Before I before I ask you to pursue that line uh, of narrative, you said something that I can't let go. Uh, you said that you often ask yourself who God is. And the way you express your answer is, quote, the next obvious thing. Can you say more about that? I wrote a piece in a a book called, um, it was a book that came out before the Synod on Youth a few years ago. And I I forget the name of the book exactly, but it was something like vocation in their own words or something like that. And I wrote a very brief piece on it and I called it the, the quiet obviousness of God, because it always seems to me that like the next obvious thing is um, where God is like calling me. I don't trust if, if, if I were to, if it were to be like a thunderclap and a lightning bolt, I would not trust it because (laughs) my experience. You are your German father's son, I must say. (laughs) (laughs) But in my experience, it has been God kind of at the end of the hallway going like this very gentle, just saying like, I'm over here. And it's like natural and kind of right down the hall. It's, and I'm jumping way ahead, but like when you called me in October of last year and said, hey, I have permission from the provincial to talk to you about possibly coming here to be the next director of campus ministry. That was not a lightning bolt to me. That was, I've been doing this work a long time. Maybe this is the next obvious thing. It certainly was to me, Keith. <laughs> and I'm glad it was to the provincial as well. <laughs> but I, I can go back in my story and find all of those moments. Like, this is the next obvious thing. And God kind of, uh, the interwoven piece there for me. So God, God reveals God's self in the next obvious, coherent move in your life. 
Yeah, it's line, it's always been linear for me. To so the point that, you, like, when I when I told when I was ready to apply to the society, the the uh, not the vocation director said, "What do your parents think?" And I said, "Oh no, I haven't told them." And he said, "Okay, you have to tell them. That <laughs> this we I can't have you apply without telling your folks." So I called my parents and I said, what are you doing this weekend? And they said nothing. And I said, can I come home and buy you lunch? Which they thought was very strange. And <laughs> we went to the Red Lobster, I'll remember, because I, if they were going to yell, I wanted it to be in a public place. Right. And I said, you know, you know, staring across breadsticks or whatever, I said, I'm going to apply to the Jesuits. And my mother, they were sitting across from me. She hit my father and she said, I told you. And, and you know it was just like it was obvious to them you know, yes, it, was, you yeah. know it was just kind of natural so when you left fairfield what was your major by the way i was a history and secondary ed a history major secondary ed minor american studies minor my last semester i did student teaching at west rocks middle school in norwalk okay so what was the next obvious thing after you after commencement so um, I was interested in doing postgrad service, uh, but I, my parents were not too keen on that. So I ended up applying to the Providence Alliance for Catholic Teachers, which is through Providence College. It's a two-year master's program, but you live in an intentional community. You make a little mm. bit of money that you pay back, uh, and you, you do a master's degree at the same time. So you're, uh. you're working full-time. I lived in a convent with uh, an old convent with seven other volunteer teachers, basically. So I applied to this program and I was going to be a social studies teacher. But social studies in Catholic high schools in New England, that's the department where like the football coaches take up space and never <laughs> retire. So I, I, hope, I hope we don't have any, uh, <laughs> any alumni or friends who are football coaches uh, or retired athletes. But go right ahead, Keith. <laughs> alienate some more people. Go right ahead. So I... But so I graduated, I don't know, whatever day it was, Michael Chevalier might know mm. here on the call, May 20th, mm. maybe. Um, the next day, this Irish Christian brother who was running the program called me and said, hi, Keith, I am sorry to tell you there are no social studies placements in any of the schools. So if I can't find a slot for you to teach, you can't do this program. And I thought, oh, no, that's not good, because this was my, I had gotten into that program in March. So like, that was my whole plan. I, I had no other plan. So he called back a week later and he said, I don't have any social studies placements, but I know you have done a lot of campus ministry as a student. I have a, a director of campus ministry in a high school. Is this something you'd be interested in? He's recounted it to me later. We've stayed friends and he was at my ordination. He said, you didn't say yet, yes out of desperation. You said, I'm really excited by that. Wow. Yeah. He, he said, that he said there's a lot of data in that answer you know that's not there was not uh, desperation there there was excitement and and vocation um and so like i started working in a high school campus ministry six weeks after i graduated from fairfield oh my goodness oh my goodness what was it like uh it was challenging it was <clears throat> a, a diocesan school so you know some limited resources uh it was up in springfield massachusetts it had been a huge school of 3,300 students at one time. Wow. It was massive. It was down to about 800 when I was there, but still in the building for 3,300. <laughs> we, were, we were swimming in space. Um, but it was, it was a challenging place in some ways. Campus ministry in general, 42-minute increments, because the bell rings every 42 minutes, was a challenge. Students had after-school jobs. Uh, and I was like learning on my feet because I was 22 years old. Uh, I was very cocky, thought I knew everything, but um, yeah, it, it was a challenge, you know. One of the nice things about it is, so Terry Devino, who I mentioned before, before he was a Jesuit, he was a diocesan priest of the Diocese of Springfield. And so he knew all these people. And so anytime I got into a, scra a scrape or something, I needed advice, I'd call Terry and say, who do you know up here who does whatever? And he knew all these people. He really, really helped me out. What were the most important things you learned about yourself and you learned about campus ministry for teenagers from that period? Young people don't like change. <laughs> uh, so I was taking over for, from someone who had been there a, a while. <clears throat> uh, we had some growing pains together, but um, students also respond. They responded to authenticity. That's something mm -hmm. I have learned over time. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell a brief story from when I, I, I worked at Holy Cross before I came to Fairfield and there was a Jesuit there who I love. I loved all the men and there's a few of them on the call tonight. Um, but we were giving a retreat and he pulled out his guitar and he put it around his head and he strummed. And I have written about this publicly on the web, so I'm not embarrassed to say it. But he strummed this, this note and, just, and he said, I wrote this in 1980. And I thought, oh, God, this is going to be horrible. And I just like buried my head in my hands, you know, because I'm thinking this doesn't speak to young people. What do you this isn't going to work. And when I looked up, the students were totally enraptured. And part of it was the the uh, atmosphere of being on retreat. That was definitely part of it. But the other part is he was being totally himself. And, and that was enough. It was totally, it was more than enough. Students were like, this is who this guy is. And yeah. he's just giving us his authentic self. And that spoke to them much more than anything that I was trying to like dress up or what impress or that. So that, uh, that I have been taught that over and over and over that students just, re they respond deeply to authenticity. I know some of the people who were on the call were at mass, uh, which I celebrated on Monday. Uh, and that's exactly what I ended up talking about. Okay. Where is real authority? Real authority is from authenticity. Yes. You know? And people can smell it a mile away if, if yeah. you're trying to exercise power without authenticity. Wow. Wow. Well, how long did you stay in that position, Paul? Uh, I, was, I was only there for two years. Uh, I had made a pact with the, uh, the dean of students that we would stay five each. I, and I ditched after two because I was feeling the draw to work with older students. Um, I had broken up with my girlfriend and I was thinking about the Jesuits. That invitation was, you know, you should think about this. And I was working with a lot of priests. There was no priests in the building. So I had to bring in men to celebrate mass and whatever. And I was just like, I think if I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about the Jesuits. I think what I would want to do is work in a Jesuit apostolate mm -hmm. to see if that's a good fit. So I applied, I applied three places, Fairfield, uh, St. Joe's U, and the University of Scranton. I came and interviewed at Fairfield, and I interviewed at Scranton, and I took the job uh, with Terry Devineau at Scranton. Uh, and I started there in 2006. And what kind of, what transition was that like? I mean, you had been in a high school, and clearly you had had the experience of a Jesuit colleges and university, and now into Scranton. So what uh, was Scranton, did it feel like a familiar uh, setting for you or uh, was it very different from what you expected and what you had experienced here? If anyone's ever seen The Office, Scranton is just like that, uh, frankly. <laughs> I, <laughs> I hated it there. Uh, for the first 75 of the first 90 days I lived there, it poured. It just rained. And I found the place so quirky and odd and I'm a New Yorker. So I think I'm like cosmopolitan or whatever. And I just thought I was kind of too cool for school and I knew everything. And once I like embraced the place that I was like, this place is quirky. And I'm just going to like go to a place that advertises itself as the world's second best wings. Cause that's <laughs> what they have on the sign. I mean, you're from the area, you know, um, it's like a quirky, quirky place, but. Oh, it is quirky quirky but the people were so good and i i have great affection i actually have great affection for springfield where i lived for two years and scranton where i lived for two years because i really feel like in both of those places i put down roots i'm like godfather to people's children in pl in those places i baptize their kids in those places um i have great affinity for the people the culture and the work and the apostolates of those places mm -hmm. um, and, and it, I feel like I really got invested in those places. So did you did you apply to the society from Scranton then, Keith? I did. So I did two years uh, at Scranton, and then I joined the society in 2008. All right. So how about novitiate? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> what, what will you allow yourself to say about your novitiate experience? <laughs> uh, Everybody like knows that novitiate is... Uh, you know, not to have too much in-house talk, but Novitiate are the first two years of this long uh, formation of a, of, a, of a young Jesuit. And it involves various experiments that St. Ignatius set up that would be uh, both an opportunity uh, to verify whether a young person was indeed called to the society, and at the same time, 
uh, to form those 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 uh, the young people who came to the society and all the experiments replicated different um, experiences of the early Jesuits as they were as they were coming to be uh, and as they were discovering what it would mean for them to be a new religious family in the church. But it's uh, all these experiments are helping both to form and to and to uh, evaluate a young person in in the in the person's mind and also in the society. So during the novitiate, it's a very intense time filled with uh, a, a great deal of discovery, of service, of of building of community. Well, for, what, for 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 you, Keith, what stood out? What would you be willing and like to share with us about that experience? For I think for all Jesuits, it's a, it's a time of great blessing. Uh, and great challenge. Yes, I think, uh, the, you know, the greatest blessing, I think, of that time, in addition to the exercises, of course, uh, and, you know, and really solidifying my vocation to the society, is my class. Uh, we entered 10. One, one man left six days in, but there, uh, eight of us took vows, and eight are ordained, and we are a very strong class together. We, I'm in contact with most of those guys every day, um, wow. Yeah, it's it's one of the great, and I look on both sides of me, the class ahead and the class behind. I'm not quite sure I would have done as well uh, hmm. if I hadn't been in the class I'm in. Um, you know, as you said, there were all these experiments. I worked in a kindergarten classroom, which I loved, and I was also terribly suited for, uh, not suited for, because I laugh. I'm an easy laugh, so I laughed at everything. And in a kindergarten classroom, everything is teachable. So. I, I remember these five-year-olds, they turned to each other and one said to another, your voice is funny. And I just, I just, you know, busted out laughing. And the teacher, she sent me out of the room. She, and she said, afterwards, she said, you can't do that to me. You, you know, <laughs> I, I, I have to teach them. You know, you can't, I, you can't do that. And it, it happened multiple times that she sent me out. Um, I was a hospital chaplain uh, in, a, uh, in a big hospital up in, in Syracuse. Um, where I saw everything from gunshot victims to tractor accidents, frankly. Um, I was an orderly in a cancer hospice. That was very mm. difficult work. I, that was very hard. Um, I worked at Georgetown in campus ministry for a semester. That was my what we would call the long experiment. Um, you know, and then different, we would say, low and humble works. So just mm -hmm. pitching mm -hmm. it around, around the house and doing whatever. At the conclusion of the two years of novitiate, uh, Jesuits pronounce their first vows, which are perpetual vows. Uh, you felt, based on the experiments and, and on your long, on your spiritual direction, and on the long retreat, the full exercises of Saint Ignatius, you're here, and uh, your history bears witness to the fact that you felt ready to to make that move to to to, to consecrate your life in this way to God's service and God's people. Yes, I mean, to use a hackneyed phrase at this point in our interview, it was the next obvious thing. And like the vows say, like, with God's grace, you know, I, I'm, and that's my definition of grace in general is like the things I desperately want that I can't make or get from myself. Like God is going to have to give me some of these things. So like the only way to live poverty, chastity, and obedience is with God's grace. It's the only way to do it. I'm going to do something different than we've uh, we've done in our past interviews, Keith. Uh, I think you've you've said so many important things, and I think you've touched on um, so many deep uh, experiences that I, I think I'd just like to stop for a second before we go any further and give people the opportunity to ask uh, for any clarification or uh, to ask any questions of Keith at this stage. Jess, do you have access to questions? Yeah, so it looks like we did have one question asking how you feel about Zoom rituals, and I'm not yeah. sure if that, you know, mass um, over Zoom perhaps is what he meant, but just in this time, being able to do or not do things based on your caution in the pandemic and age and all of that. Yeah, thanks, Jess, and thanks for the question, Harry. Yeah, <laughs> Zoom rituals, you know, there's a whole um, uh, manuscript out there from Teresa Berger, who teaches at Yale uh, Divinity School or Yale yeah, Yale Divinity School, I'm pretty sure. Um, mm. She, it's called at, you know, um, the at sign, at worship, and it's on digital worship. It's a fascinating uh, manuscript. Um, in the, I'll speak from the Catholic perspective, like li the liturgical life of Catholics is a corporeal experience and it demands an in-person, uh, an in-person experience. 
So can you celebrate the Eucharist through Zoom? I would say you really can't. You can, you can celebrate it, you, you can uh, witness it, and you can uh, unite yourself to the worshiping body, but can you celebrate in the way that the church like intends and totally understands? Not really, you know, which is why mass on TV for shut-ins is, is an alternative. It's become necessary in COVID because it's what we got, but like getting back to in-person uh, feels super important. Uh, and I found like when we were able to start doing that, it was very emotional. And part of that is because it's a corporeal experience that like we're meant to be together. Even like, you know, it's, it's odd, Jerry. I don't know if you have this experience. We all live in the same house for the most part, you know, we're sharing meals and stuff. Both Jerry and I live in the, in the residence halls, but um, we're, we're still not shaking hands in the Jesuit community at the sign of peace, which I find very odd. Uh, you know, and I go to the 1210 mass, soon to be 1230, uh, a fair bit, and everyone waves, right? So I see Joan Bolger on the call, we wave, you know, and because uh, that's what we got right now. It's not great. It's what we have to do. Uh, but until we're back to like the full corporeal experience, uh, it, it, it's it's a poor substitute is, is the best way to answer it. Thanks, Keith. Keith, one of your colleagues from uh, Campus Ministry uh, presents a, a wonderful question. Um, what do you most love about your ministry in campus ministry? What do you most love about it? Yeah, I mean, watching, watching self-discovery uh, and watching people understand that they are the beloved children of God is mm -hmm. always very moving to me. Well, you know, what's hard I find about working in higher ed, I don't know if others on the call would agree, is that we're, we're getting older, you know, every year we get older. Students are always the same age. They're always 18 to 22, essentially. But we're getting older and older. But to watch mm. the, the discovery that happens between 18 and 22, the pandemic has thrown that off a little bit. I usually say, you know, first years arrive and they're four years out of the eighth grade. This year, first years are kind of four years out of the sixth grade, uh, we're finding. Like they are, they're a little mm. developmentally delayed. Um, but watching the self-discovery that is appropriate to the age uh, is, is, I find, just awesome. Um, I've done a fair bit of spiritual direction and retreat work in my life as well, both with students and with, with, with adults, with other people. And, you know, some of my classmates will give me, you know, they give me a hard time. I'll, I spent multiple summers doing the same type of work. And they'll say, shouldn't you do something else? And I say, it's really selfish work in some ways because I get to see what God is up to. When you sit across, and you would understand this very well, Jerry, when you sit across from somebody in spiritual direction in retreat ministry, you get an insight on how God is working individually with an individual person. And that is more and more data about who God is for me. Mm -hmm. So like, I am totally interested in that question all the time. Um, and, and, and working with students and others is, is great experience and very exciting, frankly. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. That was Katie. Thanks for the question. Did you ask her in, in advance? Did you set you set this up with Katie ahead of time? No, no. <laughs> Keith, as all of you, uh, I think all of you who are on this call know that Jesuit uh, formation is very long. Um, so I'm not going to ask Keith to go through it stage by stage, location by location. But Keith, uh, as you think back after Navishit, you were sent to do philosophy studies. Uh, mixed up with more humanities and social studies. And then you were given an assignment, kind of an internship, of what we call the Regency. And then you went to theology. Um, I leave it to you to choose one or other of those periods to talk about, or else uh, a continuity through those periods that is important in understanding your and God's story. Yeah, I'll draw. I'll try and pull a thread through. You know, mm -hmm. I frankly I hated philosophy, and I don't think that's an uncommon experience in, especially in my generation of Jesuits. I think you know a lot of us were just, you know, we were. I think part of the issue is you do two years of novitiate and you are on fire as an apostle, and you take these vows, and the first thing they ask you to do is to put your butt in a chair and study. Right. And yeah. That yeah. is a real challenge for men who want to like change the world. I mean, essentially, that's what happens. And you're being asked to study something that feels very um, esoteric and abstract and not important. 
one of the things that Loyola, when I, Loyola Chicago, where I was sent was they said, find your question. And I didn't find that terribly helpful advice in the moment, but it was helpful over time because find your question is the thread here. Because when I was sent to Holy Cross to do work in campus ministry, I tried to find, I, I wanted to enter that work and I wanted to get to know the people. And in getting to know the people, I had questions about like their experience that they were asking me, that I was asking of them. And then I brought those questions to theology. Uh, and so uh, by the time I got back to theology and then I realized that the philosophy study was going to help me do the theology, that was a long-term lesson. Uh, then I had a lot of questions, you know, like, again, I said, I, I study ritual studies and like, you know, in the West here, there is an increasing amount of people who believe, who understand biologically that uh, wheat is poison for their bodies. What does that mean for us as Catholics who like bread is our bread is it like we are we celebrate with wheat so like what is that going to mean for us as a gathering body we've got to we've got to start wrestling with that question you know that that is a real question i think uh, it's a very western question but like that's where i live and work so like um it, that's a question i'm thinking about and that is a question that is born of like walking with people and you know people who come to the sacristy and say i need a low gluten host you know like these are, that's an interesting question to me, you know, mm -hmm. lots of questions I have about like gender, you know, lots of questions, uh, just sacramental questions. So um, again, pulling the thread through, I don't know if this answers your question totally, but like, what are the people's questions? How can I uh, intersect with the people's questions? And what are my questions that I'm bringing to the people? Thank you, Keith. Keith, um, Terry Devineau said to you, in the early years of your time at Fairfield, uh, you ought to think about being a Jesuit. What do you think now about being a Jesuit? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to butcher this, but you know, Stephen Sondheim just died a few weeks ago. Um, mm. Who was a you know a famous composer and uh, Broadway legend, uh, and he had a, a song. Katie might actually know it, um, but it, it it was a song about marriage. And it said, you know, you see your, your spouse and, and you love them and you hate them. <laughs> and, and, and they said, and the answer is yes. You know, and there's something true about all vocations in that way. You know, like they are challenging. They are deeply uh, gratifying. They are, um, they're everything, you know, they're, and they're a, a student at Holy Cross asked me, um, did you always want to be a Jesuit? And my, I was very close with this student and he just entered the Jesuits in August actually. And I said to him, very unguarded, but I said, I'm still not sure I want to be a priest, but I think God wants me to be a priest and the people want me to be a priest. And if that's true, then I want to, then I want to do that. Um, but like, cause if a man says he wants to be a priest and the people don't want it, that's not going to go so well. <laughs> <laughs> so like it's not really it's not that I'm unimportant in the equation but I'm not the most important part of that equation you know so um I don't know again I'm not sure that it totally answers your question but like we, we read in De Deuteronomy like it comes upon you the blessing and the curse and that is what this life is it's a blessing and it's a curse because this life has given me insight it has helped me to feel deeply it has helped me um look more broadly but if you're going to feel deeply and look more broadly you're going to hurt more and you're going to see more pain and like that's the cost of doing business if you're going to be a jesuit and if, if I, I i wouldn't want to go back i wouldn't want to redo it and not do it but there is a cost to it as well keith uh you know keith mentioned that he has uh this really uh extraordinary group of uh confrères, the young Jesuits that he uh, that he entered the society with. And it's been to our great benefit in our community that they're so close that they come to visit Keith and they and they hang out in our house and uh, they make our house all the richer and more joyful um, and louder. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's and that's a delight. Um, Keith, uh, all of you in your time uh, are aware that you entered an order that was vastly diminished. When I go out and visit 
uh, our alumni and alumnae, and some of you who are on this call have said this to me. You know, Father, when I was at Fairfield, there were 70 Jesuits. Um, and there are fewer, and you mentioned there were 30 Jesuits when you were here. What does it mean for you and your confreres, your, 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 your classmates, to enter a society that at least numerically uh, is surely diminished and there are no signs that that diminishment has, uh, has reached its deepest trough. How do you all deal with that? I, I'll tell a brief story about Tom Regan, actually. So Tom Regan, I'm sure many people on the call remember Tom, a longtime professor of philosophy. He left Fairfield to become the provincial of New England province, and he was the provincial that admitted me. I have a long history with Tom. When I transferred to Fairfield, he was an associate dean in arts and sciences and handled my transfer application. Uh, the credits. And then he was the provincial that admitted me. And when I got to Loyola Chicago, he was the Dean of Philosophy. So <laughs> I, I've kind of followed Tom along or he's followed me. I can't tell. Um, but when we were novices, he came, it was his last year as provincial. And he said something similar. He said, you know, people are always asking about, you know, diminished numbers. And he said, what I say to them is like the fifties and sixties were the aberration. Mm -hmm. We never had numbers like that before. And That's we right. haven't had them since. Ignatius would start a work, he'd send two priests and a brother, and then they'd get it going, and then they'd kind of arrange to hand it off, and then he'd send them to do something else. So, like, numbers have never, I'm not a numbers person, you know, and we have this conversation in campus ministry, like, numbers themselves, these are not helpful benchmarks for us, you know. Um, but what I find really moving is, like, my eight classmates or seven classmates are solid guys and they're, this is not a knock on Jesuits who have come before, but like, you know, we came in with experience with backgrounds that like, we're, we're good, you know? And I find with every generation, there is more experience and more diverse backgrounds of people coming in. And, you know, again, I'm coming from Holy Cross in Worcester and we sent one student into the society in the Midwest province, which I wanted to get him for the East Coast, but I, his mother would have murdered me, I think. Um, but, you know, like when I look at him entering, I'm like, we're going to be fine. Because like the next generation is, what is, what is the Latin phrase? Spes, spes gregis, the hope of the flock. Yeah, the hope right? of the flock. Yeah, like that. I, I have great hope when I look down when I look, you know, to the next generation, I, I don't worry about numbers or, and, you know, we're going to live the poverty we've prayed for and the poverty that we have, um, that we have vowed. Um, and, but that doesn't scare me. Or I'm not worried about that. Keith, um, when you talk about this young man and his entering and the way you feel about him, uh, that's the way that I, and I think all of us feel about you. When we see you and what you bring back to your alma mater and what you bring to our community, what you bring to the church and to the society, um, we're not worried. Uh, the, future, the future of the society is in God's hands, but humanly speaking, uh, there's plenty of evidence that God knows what God is doing uh, by bringing us the men that God has brought us. I'd like to open up the, uh, the conversation to those of you who have been dying to ask Keith for clarification or who'd like to, uh, you know, maybe challenge him or ask him for more, uh, more insight, please. Uh, just do they, people field questions to you or are they, please? Yeah, if anybody has anything, absolutely feel free to submit it in the chat. Um, I will say, as we're giving people a chance to, to type things in, Father Mac, as you know, I was a year ahead of you at Fairfield. So I was here on 9-11 and can absolutely echo what you said about that day. I remember being at that mass on that lawn and just looking around and thinking, my God, this, this is a community. And this is what we need to have on Fairfield's campus and on campuses throughout the country and communities throughout the country. And it really was this was uh, i'm glad that this was where i was on that day for sure i remember i don't know if you you probably do jess i'm pretty sure it was the same year um and ellen would remember of course because it was her colleague but elizabeth dreyer she mm -hmm. there was a hostage situation in her classroom yeah it was five uh, or six that, months later yeah yes that same year and i i went straight to the chapel <laughs> to offer a prayer because i didn't know what else to do yeah. Uh, it was on CNN. It was a very scary afternoon. Uh, and, you know, I, I had a friend in the classroom, you know, and it, but I, it was a moment again for me where I said, like, this is the type of like place 
mm -hmm. and like, and this is the type of place I want to be. And, and it just drew me, certainly. Absolutely. It looks like everyone's either, everyone's being shy or perhaps you guys have already covered everything and everybody wanted to ask about, but this was fantastic. I really enjoyed getting to hear a little bit more about you, Father Mac, and we love having you here on campus. And we have, oh, we have somebody who's been attending mass in your homily on waffles. Interesting. I'd love to hear about that. <laughs> it, it was it was pancakes, but I... Um... I, I told a brief story that I had this uh, brunch with these, with a few nuns, the apostles of the Sacred Heart. And, you know, one of them, I just noticed, one didn't use any syrup and the, the other used a little bit. And I'm a, I like dump the bottle out when I have, when I have these things. And I used it as an image of like, what is, to, what is our commitment, right? Are we kind of a, a, a dipped, a dunked or a soaked type of uh, Christian essentially? Uh, it was memorable, I, I guess. So. <laughs> I really, guess. it was enough that he told his mom about it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> this is where the theater background still can come in handy, you know, like <laughs> someone asked me that not long ago, like, well, do you yet get to use it? I said, I just traded in drama of one kind for high drama of another. You know? <laughs> yeah, but but, but I, I, you don't ham it up. You're, an ex you're, you're a beautiful celebrant, Keith. Uh, you, you let the liturgy and the ritual carry itself. And, um, and again, we're all very grateful for that. My son, Billy Fitzpatrick, transferred from Holy Cross to Holy Cross from a large uni public university in the South. I don't get the rest. Is the rest of the question? I know Billy Fitzpatrick well. Um, I think he may have signed off already, uh, Patricia, because Jim Hayes was on this call before. Uh, Billy was very involved in the chaplain's office at Holy Cross, and uh, he, he was especially involved with the men's retreat. That became a, a a thing that he was very involved with. So great to see you on, on, on here. Good to hear about Billy. Well, Jess, I think, I think if this, uh, if there are no more questions or observations, uh, I want to thank Keith and uh, say again that um, I'm not worried about numbers either. If God keeps sending us young Jesuits of the quality of Keith Makowitz. Thank you all for the support that you gave him when he was a student here. Carolyn, I think especially of you, and I look at Ellen, you know, thank you, Ellen, for helping create the kind of community uh, that uh, fostered uh, this man's journey into the mystery of God's service. Uh, thank you all, and just thank you, and Janet, and all of my colleagues here in alumni, in the alumni office for organizing this wonderful series. Yes, and thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Father Jerry and Father Mac, and Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy New Year. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you again in 2022.